So I say with more money in circulation, you'd be... Better turn off your pumps, Hap, Stu said mildly. The pumps? What? Norm Bruet had turned to look out the window. Christ on a pony, he said. Stu got out of his chair, leaned over Tommy Wanamaker and Hank Carmichael, and flicked off all eight switches at once, four with each hand. So he was the only one who didn't see the Chevy as it hit the gas pumps on the upper island and sheared them off. It plowed into them with a slowness that seemed implacable and somehow grand. Tommy Wanamaker swore in the Indian head the next day that the taillights never flashed once. The Chevy just kept coming at a steady fifteen or so, like the pace car in the Tournament of Roses parade. The undercarriage screeched over the concrete island, and when the wheels hit it, everyone but Stu saw the driver's head swing limply and strike the windshield, starring the glass. The Chevy jumped like an old dog that had been kicked and plowed away the high-test pump. It snapped off and rolled away, spilling a few dribbles of gas. The nozzle came unhooked and lay glittering under the fluorescence. They all saw the sparks produced by the Chevy's exhaust pipe grating across the cement, and Hap, who had seen a gas station explosion in Mexico, instinctively shielded his eyes against the fireball he expected. Instead, the Chevy's rear end flirted around and fell off the pump island on the station side. The front end smashed into the low lead pump, knocking it off with a hollow bang. Almost deliberately, the Chevrolet finished its 360-degree turn, hitting the island again, broadside this time. The rear end popped up on the island and knocked the regular gas pump a sprawl. And there the Chevy came to rest, trailing its rusty exhaust pipe behind it. It had destroyed all three of the gas pumps on that island nearest the highway. The motor continued to run choppily for a few seconds and then quit. The silence was so loud it was alarming. "'Holy moly!' Tommy Wanamaker said breathlessly. "'Will she blow, Hap?' "'If it was gonna, it already woulda,' Hap said, getting up. His shoulder bumped the map case, scattering Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona every which way. Hap felt a cautious sort of jubilation. His pumps were insured, and the insurance was paid up. Mary had harped on the insurance ahead of everything. "'Guy must have been pretty drunk,' Norm said. "'I seen his taillights,' Tommy said, his voice high with excitement. "'They never flashed once. Holy moly! If he'd have been doing sixty, we'd all be dead now.' They hurried out of the office, Hap first and Stu bringing up the rear. Hap, Tommy, and Norm reached the car together. They could smell gas and hear the slow clock-like tick of the Chevy's cooling engine. Hap opened the driver's side door, and the man behind the wheel spilled out like an old laundry sack. "'God damn!' Norm Bruet shouted, almost screamed. He turned away, clutched his ample belly, and was sick. It wasn't the man who had fallen out. Hap had caught him neatly before he could thump to the pavement. But the smell that was issuing from the car, a sick stench compounded of blood, fecal matter, vomit, and human decay— it was a ghastly, rich, sick-dead smell. A moment later, Hap turned away, dragging the driver by the armpits. Tommy hastily grabbed the dragging feet, and he and Hap carried him into the office. In the glow of the overhead fluorescence, their faces were cheesy-looking and revolted. Hap had forgotten about his insurance money. The others looked into the car, and then Hank turned away, one hand over his mouth, little fingers sticking off like a man who has just raised his wine glass to make a toast. He trotted to the north end of the station's lot and let his supper come up. Vic and Stu looked into the car for some time, looked at each other, and then looked back in. On the passenger side was a young woman, her shift dress hiked up high on her thighs. Leaning against her was a boy or girl, about three years old. They were both dead. Their necks had swelled up like inner tubes, and the flesh was a purple-black color, like a bruise. The flesh was puffed out under their eyes, too. They looked, Vic later said, like those baseball players who put lamp-black under their eyes to cut the glare. Their eyes bulged sightlessly. The woman was holding the child's hand. Thick mucus had run from their noses and was now clotted there. Flies buzzed around them, lighting in the mucus, crawling in and out of their open mouths. Stu had been in the war, but he had never seen anything so terribly pitiful as this. His eyes were constantly drawn back to those linked hands. 